Good evening. I'm Kathy Cavallari. I'm president of the Westboro Historical Society. We're thrilled to have a big crowd here this evening. Uh, no surprise, because Phil's uh, slide presentations of Westboro history are very popular each year. But this, this might be a new record, folks. Um, in case you're not aware, the Westboro Historical Society was founded in 1889 uh, to preserve local history through research, programs, and the preservation of artifacts. Our headquarters is the Sibley House, an 1844 Greek Revival home of the slaymaker William Sibley, located at 13 Parkman Street. In the house, we house three centuries of artifacts of Westboro's history dating back to the founding of the town in 1717. For more than a century, the Society's mission has been to celebrate local history and bring that history to life through our monthly presentations like this one, Sibley House tours, which we hope to offer in the spring, and special events. If you enjoyed tonight's program, and I'm sure you will, I encourage you to like our Facebook page, Westboro Historical Society, and check out our website, www.westborohistory.org. You can also consider becoming a member through our website. Uh, membership is inexpensive. It's $10 for seniors, and uh, you will get emails uh, about our activities each month and get invited to a couple of parties. Uh, let's see. Uh, I would like to mention that tonight's program is co-sponsored by The Willows. Thank you, Polly. You're and also by the Westboro Civic Club. And the Civic Club co-sponsorship is really a thank you because they have uh, participated with us in a couple of activities or events or, that you'll hear about shortly. Um, together, we are co-sponsoring a memorial bench in Memorial Cemetery, the oldest cemetery in town opposite Town Hall that dates back to 1714, that bench will be dedicated to Nahor Rice, who was the young five-year-old who unfortunately uh, was killed in the Indian raid uh, of the Rice Boys. Uh, and he was the first person buried in that grave plain that we now call Memorial Cemetery. So um, Chris Allen spirited a, uh, a, 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 an effort to create a memorial bench in his name and his memory that um, we are doing jointly with the Westboro Civic Club, and that will be dedicated August 4th at 12 noon, which is Nahor's date of death. Um, let's see, the, the other thing we're doing together is along with the Rotary Club, the Historical Society and the Civic Club join together with David Nurse to uh, create a new plaque in Minuteman Park uh, that commemorates not just the one Minuteman company that was summoned to Lexington and Concord on April 19th of 1775. There were actually three companies that were summoned, two militia companies as well. And one of David Nurse's ancestors was among those two other companies. So he felt it very important that that plaque reflect all the Westboro citizens that were summoned to arms to, um, to go to Lexington and Concord, where they were too late for that battle, they continued on to Bunker Hill, where they did participate in the battle. So um, we supported that effort along with the Rotary and the, and the Civic Club, and we all contributed. And that plaque is in place. It's sitting on a rock from Nurse Farm, uh, if you go down to Minuteman Park uh, these days. And it will be dedicated, I believe, on Patriot's Day in April. Uh, so I just want to mention that. So now let me tell you something about our presenter tonight. Phil Kittredge is a Westboro native and a graduate of Westboro High School. After graduating from college, he was appointed to the Westboro Fire Department where he worked for, wait for it, 42 years before retiring in 2013. Phil is a local historian and his collection of Westboro images has appeared in numerous books and publications. His collection includes about 600 glass negatives, 500 mounted images, 130 stereo views, and 3,000 postcards. His first book, Images of America, Westboro, was published in 2020. He's currently working on his next book about the Massachusetts State Reform School and the Lyman School for Boys. He resides in Westboro with his lovely wife, Donna, sitting over there, and I want to mention that for the past 
11 years, Phil and Donna have also run Westboro's food pantry. Not an easy job, especially during the pandemic. Uh, and I, they are certainly dedicated members of our community, and we love them. And now I'd like to present Bill, Bill Kittredge. I feel so famous. It's just me and neighbor down the street, remember. Well, welcome. Being a former firefighter is the one thing I always like to do, is I want you to be aware of where the exits are in case something does happen. We've got a lot of people here tonight with multiple exits out of the building. So please remember, the closest exits might not be the, ex the entrance that you came in. So if something does happen, find your way to the exit. Be alert and be aware of the people that are in walkers and just go outside into the hallway until somebody tells you what to do. And hopefully nothing will happen. But that's the fire department in me. All right, again, thank you to the uh, Historical Society and the Willows and the Westboro Civic Club. Westboro Civic Club is a tremendous organization that helps out numerous groups in town. They're a very, very strong supporter of the Westboro Food Pantry and we appreciate them. All right. Now, how many, how many people remember this? Remember when it first came out in the 60s, early 60s, when black and white TV was turning into color? And you know how much, we, how much more we enjoyed television when it was in color? Well, all the glass negatives that you're going to see tonight are from my collection. They've all been digitally restored that means cleaned, polished, and then scanned with a black and white image, and then touched up, just like you would in a dark room, you know, the spots, the scratches, and then I digitize them into color. So it gives a little bit more, um, they're a lot more enjoyable to watch. <coughs> so, get ready. Now, the, the Iron Horse, that's what it was called, uh, arrived in Westboro, and believe it or not, the first train, this is exactly what they look like. The, uh, the engineer did not ride on the engine, and the reason for that was these engines had a tendency to blow up. So, it, oh, I'm sorry. How's that? Can everybody see now? Okay. I get in your way, and you just yell at me, all right? <laughs> Throw a shoe at me, and I'll, I'll get out of the way. So, the, uh, the, what they did was they put a baggage car between the steam engine and the passengers, so if it did blow up, at least all it would do is destroy your luggage. <laughs> and the first trains, remember, trains like this were very unsophisticated. They ran maybe between five and seven miles an hour, and what they did was they actually took wagons that were on the road being pulled by horses and outfitted them with train wheels. And the same with the stagecoaches. They took the stagecoaches, took the wheels off, put train wheels on them, and then they put them behind the train. So the train didn't go very fast, but it was usually reliable. Um, there's a couple well-documented cases where the train had so many people on it, they had to get off and see the swamp and actually help push the train into the station because it's an <laughs> uphill grade there. So they're not, you know, we, the way we think of trains, steam engines, we don't think of engines like this. But this is what they, fir they first looked like. So on November 15th, 1834, which is a long time ago, almost 200 years, the uh, first train arrived in Westboro Center. And it was such an important event, the, uh, the uh, special piece of music was composed, and then the, uh, the uh, office and members of the uh, Rifle Rangers of Boston rode the train out. They went up to the Lions Farm, and Westboro had, had a big celebration. And all the merchants were excited about this because this was a big, big deal for the town. And what happened was, if you're familiar with the way Westboro started, and the, the first area of really commercial growth and industrial growth was on Route 9, Turnpike Road. And it's because we had the Turnpike. A Pony Express came out that way, the stagecoaches came out, we had the inns, we had the hotels. <coughs> And that all started to come to an end once the train arrived. The uh, former Western Tavern, right at the intersection of Park Street and Route 9, this is on the westbound side of Route 9, 
Uh, originally, he, Mr. Wesson built this building in 1825 after he moved from the Forbish Tavern and started this building. It had a bunch of uses from 1825, but once the train arrived, by 1840, he was out of business. The stagecoaches stopped coming, the mail stopped coming, um, the this traveling salesmen stopped coming because they all took the train and to the new part of Westboro. So after he closed, it became a school, the Westboro School Association decided to have a seminary and a school for girls to help increase their knowledge, high school and advanced high school education. That only lasted about nine years. And that went out of business. Dr. Hero came to town and he decided that he was gonna open the Willow Park Water Cure and Hygienic Institute. So um, we'll scrub you clean and we'll give you water and you'll be fine no matter what ails you. <laughs> and if you look at the, the details of the facility, they could cure everything. Everything was all cured with water and, and a good sponge bath. Um, but unfortunately, this didn't last. And after about 15 years, he decided to close that. And you'll see on the right, this is on the back of that, his uh, literature for the, uh, the uh, Hygienic Institute. He talks about, in 1867, He's decided to close the institute, and he wants to open up a seminary uh, for young girls. So, and he was asking in this letter to the gentleman he wrote it to, is if he knew of someone that would be a good president for the school. Now, that only lasted for about 10 years, and the property became vacant again, sat vacant for quite a while until the, the state started renting the building for housing for the Lyman School for Boys. Now the Lyman School for Boys was relatively new, originally started up at the Massachusetts State Reform School where the state hospital was, at Lake Chauncey, and because of a lot of issues with the school, the state decided to close it and open up a, a, more, a more improved and a new style of uh, housing the, uh, the delinquents. And remember, yeah, the, the Westboro Library's got a, get the, the log book, the intake book of all the students that were admitted to um, the State Reform School, and some of them were committed there for stealing an apple. Um, some of them were committed because um, the parents had too many kids, and these kids ran loose on the streets. Uh, these were not bad kids. And if you read some of the reports, they're fascinating reading uh, poor Jimmy, he was committed there because he, he stole an apple and his mother and father were divorced and his mother used to drink a lot so Billy was there at the school and on the, uh, the, next, the next day they talked about how's he doing. Well, he's been here for a few months now, he does great and he only needs to be beaten twice a week. So, this picture here is now the new approved Lyman School for Boys on Route 9. This is the old Nathan Fisher house. Uh, the physicians from Westboro would come up and uh, um, do medical checks and tests on the boys if there was something wrong with them. Um, this is most likely one of the, uh, the doctor's cats checking on a student up at the school. Where he's parked is Route 9. That dirt road is uh, Route 9, right by uh, right by Park Street. A little east was the Nathan Fisher house. Um, Nathan Fisher had a store there. This was also where we had the post office, the first post office, until they determined that the post office needed to be moved to the center of Westboro where all the, the activity was occurring. So this, they lost this when the railroad came to town. Uh, interesting note about this particular house. Um, behind this house was the first use of a steam-powered machinery in Westboro. And then a little farther east again down near Lyman Street is the Forbush Tavern. This is where the, the, uh, the Wesson Tavern got its idea. They moved up in the bit, they built their new building. The Forbush Tavern ended up becoming residential housing and it was purchased to, for commercial development. The town, in its wisdom, 
decided that they'd save the building, so they cut the building in half, loaded it onto trucks, and trucked it down by Lake Chauncey and stored it in a field. And the vandals, on their third attempt, were successful in burning the buildings down. So we lost that building. Now, this is a map. Hopefully everybody can see this okay. This is the, the map of downtown Westboro. And if you look right here, that's the center of town. Now we call it the Rotary. Well, believe it or not, it's actually a square. And you can see right there, by, by this image, it is a square. And it's actually, the, the official name is Fairbanks Square, named after a postmaster and a, a, a captain from the Civil War. Um, the railroad tracks that you see all to your right, that's when the railroad tracks came up Brigham Street, went right through the center of town, and right up Milk Street, and then continued on into Worcester. On the right-hand side at the top are the new proposed railroad tracks where they are located now. So this is, this is right about, I think this map is around 1888. And you can see all the industry that decided, that, that popped up because of the railroad tracks. And all of those sidings were needed for all the businesses that happened in Westboro. So what do we have? Well, we had boot shops. We had uh, we had 500 people making boots and shoes in 1853, and the population of Westboro at that time was only 2,700. Um, by 1870, we had over 50 men making sleighs from um, boys up at the Lyman School, and, uh, or the State Reform School, and actually afterwards at the State Hospital they manufactured sleighs, and the sleigh manufacturers in town were upset with the state because they thought that the boys were doing the labor and the work for free and the state could sell a, the, uh, the slaves at a, at a cheaper price. And then by 1873, right about where Bay State Commons is right now is where the National Straw Works was. They employed 1,800 people making straw hats. Um, so there was, certainly was a lot of manufacturing opportunities for people in Westboro and the surrounding towns to work. On Milk Street, at Phillips Street, this is Gould and Walker. And you can see th these were huge buildings, huge wood buildings. And I'll tell you how they all ended. They burned down. This one burned down. Uh, burned down 1947 in the big fire. Um, but one of the things that Gould and Walker were famous for was making mucklucks for the United States Army. Um, and they supplied the Army with all the mucklucks, the canvas and uh, rubber soles. Now we talked about sleighs. This was the Cadillac of sleigh manufacturers. Um, Forbes Sleigh Factory over on Summer Street. You know where the Dairy Queen is? Well, just behind the Dairy Queen is where Forbes Sleigh Factory was. Um, if you wanted a high quality sleigh with all the bells and whistles, this is where you went. And their sleighs were respected throughout the country. Their, they, uh, their quality was well known. They had catalogs. They were quite the company. For, for a small group, they produced quite a, a fantastic product. Now, the Humber Bicycle Factory, well, yes, we started to get bicycles. People got tired of riding the horses. So somebody came up with a bright idea, we'll, we'll invent bicycles. Great idea. So the Humber Bicycle Company, um, they produced bicycles. They produced a top quality bike that is very, very desirable and collectible even to today. I recently saw an auction where one of them sold for over $10,000. Um, they closed because what happened, as the bicycle replaced the horse, the locomobile replaced the bicycle. And now we saw motorcycles and, and locomobiles starting to occur. Now the locomobile factory moved and went to Connecticut, and the building was vacant. And then the Westboro Tannery took it over, and they operated there for until the 1970s. The building became vacant, and uh, Westboro Country Village wanted to be built, so they decided to tear the building down, but then they looked and they were told they could have anthrax in the building. So they decided that they would burn the building instead. So they burned the building, getting rid of all the anthrax, the anthrax spores that they were, they thought might be in the building. And everything was fine. 
They hauled everything away and then they started construction and they found hundreds and hundreds of hides buried 10, 12 feet deep on the property. Mm -hmm. Took them another three or four months just to remove all the hides and uh, get the property clean. Now, when you have any type of company that manufactures something, you have somebody that, that decides to improve upon maybe the accessories. Now, the Hunt Manufacturing Company, they manufactured expensive saddles. So you could buy your bike, but if you wanted a, a special saddle, special style, you, you'd go to them. And believe it or not, you could actually go there and have one custom fit to the size of your derriere. <laughs> would make one exactly what you wanted so you could put it on your own bike. This building is on South Street. It was just to the right of the Grand Army Hall, um, which is, oh, it's on the side of the street that the 7-Eleven uh, is on, down probably two or three buildings. And behind there was their large manufacturing facility. Again, the same thing. They made it, Westboro was famous for having top quality products and having reputations, having the best of the best. The hat shop on Milk Street. It's about uh, in the area where the fire, the present fire station is now. The, um, again, employed hundreds and hundreds of workers, changed over the years. If you look at some of the early pictures of Westboro, almost every gentleman is wearing a straw hat. Um, People dressed up all the time back then. They had suits on, they had ties. Lady had beautiful, beautiful dresses. Um, nobody was walking around with sweatshirts, sweatsuits on and t-shirts. And this building burned in 1947. Now the National Straw Works. This was on East Main Street, um, right about where um, downtown crossing, the end between the two entrances of downtown crossing. You know where the the Forbes Community House is, and across from the mobile gas station. Mm -hmm. This started right there at Brigham Street and went all the way down to um, the, the great big brick building that's down there now, next to the Shell Station. Uh, on the right is the National Straw Works. To the left of that is the Westboro Trunk and Bag. The National Straw Works also used part of the building. And way down on the end on the left is the National House. That was a rooming house that the, the hotel built, or the, was a hotel that the the National Straw Works built so their employees could do, had, have a place to live. Because there was a shortage of housing in Westboro back then. And the best thing about that, there was a bar room and they could have uh, meals on the first floor of the, uh, of the building. Uh, this burned in 1917. Now, if you're a manufacturer and you produce a product and you want to have it shipped by train, it needs to be crated. You can't just take a bicycle and throw it on the train and expect it to get to Chicago or Ohio, wherever. So the Bartlett Box Company would have a large um, presence with all of these businesses and they would supply custom-made boxes for bicycles custom made boxes for anything that for the hats, anything that went out of here, was row by train, had to be boxed. So you can see the size of the complex, it was, it was huge. This area down there, there was probably seven or eight different railroad sightings. So as industry occurred, it brought everything else up. It brought more and more jobs to Westboro. And Westboro, even though it was an, an a industrial town, it still had other agricultural parts of it too. Now the Bedstead Factory, Foster Richardson, they made the highest quality brass beds in the country. Um, and unfortunately, guess what happened to this building? Oh, you guys are learning, you're a quick learning. It did burn, and along with um, half a dozen other businesses along the railroad tracks. Part of the problem was, Westboro had a volunteer fire department, but the biggest issue was Westboro had no water to fight fires in the center of town. And believe it or not, that did not change until 1947, after the big fire on Milk Street. It took them that long. Everything was all dependent on water, gravity feeding down from the reservoir. Now the only building left out of all of these buildings that we've seen tonight 
This one's still standing on Milk Street, the Westboro Weaving Company. Now the Westboro Weaving Company was in business oh, until I think around sometime in the 50s and the 60s. The, the building was, was purchased by Herb Kenworthy and he started uh, Kenworthy Brothers. They manufactured adhesives and some other different products and they actually put a third story on the building. So the building still stands there today, Mill Street, right by Spring Street. Remember where they used to park all the school buses? That's right there. <coughs> so the big thing, the trains came through the center of town and they were a huge distraction for, uh, for everybody. They were loud, they were noisy, and not that, you know, they were dirty, not that the center of town was anything to speak about. It, <laughs> you know, it's all dirt, it's all mud, and as you can see the little areas that are dark, that's from the water carts. The horse run, they had great big barrels on the back, the spigots, and they would pull those around to try to keep the dust down. And if you look at some of the pictures, you'll actually see where people would, they would walk in little trails. So that as it would get worn down, there would there'd be less, du less dust. So the noise and smoke was horrible. And I remember, and that's just not the, the noise or the clanging of the train. It's because we have a railroad siding here. These trains are going forward, they're backing up. Every time they go forward, they blow the whistle once. They, when they back up, they blow it a couple of times. They ring the bells, they bang into cars. Doors get open and closed. It was horrible. So the meeting house said, that's it, we've had it. We're out of here. So they left. The building was purchased, and the building was actually jacked up, was raised up in another floor underneath, very similar to what they did at the Congregational Church, where they jacked up the church and had another floor underneath. And there was, a, there was vegetable and fruit stands on the lower level in the basement, other businesses on the first floor, and offices up on the second floor. And if you look to the right, this is right where the present arcade building is right now. And the left of the building where you see that Westboro furniture, that's Milk Street where the stop sign is. So it explains where that is. And to the right, that's where you go up towards the fire station and the Dairy Queen. And that's sitting right on the rotary. So, uh, but you'll notice right to the right, you'll see a freight car within about five feet of the meeting house. So you can understand why they were aggravated with the situation. Um, and, and as a side note, you see that beautiful tree out front? You see the gentleman sitting out front? Chris knows who they are. The Mosquito Fleet. The Mosquito Fleet is right. They used to hang out there and they had all the gossip going on in Westboro. That's where the men hang, used to hang out and, and discuss all the gossip and how to run the town. This building was eventually torn down. It didn't burn down, it was torn down and replaced by the present arcade that's down there right now. Here's a picture from the top of the uh, Congregational Church tower, looking back towards Milk Street. There's the, uh, the hat shop over on the left. And you can see the smoke from the steam engines working in the area. Now imagine, nobody has air conditioning, everybody has their windows open. So you get this, and if anybody smelled coal smoke, it, it stinks. It's not like a nice wood fire you know, where everything smells nice. This would stink, there's a very bitter smell to it. So this was now coming into the house, but we had to live with it. Again, over 20 trains per day passed through the square. Um, some days more, some days some less. And the square back then in West Grove was the area where there was all the public demonstrations would occur. The fire department, whenever they got a new piece of equipment, they would bring it out and demonstrate it, usually after a 4th of July parade. Um, this is the Jackson Steamer in action. So again, they, uh, you know, wood fired, and this would produce steam, that which would run a pump, which would allow them to shoot water uh, on a fire. You see the horse trough to the right, that's been restored, that's still downtown. Yep. And in the distance, you can see a freight train going through. And in the far distance, you can actually see the, the Burnside building. When the big fire in 1917 occurred, the Worcester Fire Department loaded steamers 
onto flat cars and shipped them to Westboro, to the Westboro station where they were unloaded and they were brought down and they were able to pump water and help at the big fire in 1917, which destroyed the, the entire National Straw Works and about 14 or 15 other buildings and uh, burned all the way down to the, the big the big brick building that's down there, the Kenworthy Brothers, or call it the Kenworthy Building, Oddfellow Building. Um, it's gonna have a bunch of diff different names. That particular building has um, caught fire, burned inside, but they say the brick on that building um, was what saved the, the rest of the buildings going down the street. The, um, uh, if you look at that building again, you see the Odd Fellows emblem up on the top. The freight trains came back to Boston. They usually, what, what, this is the Boston and Worcester Railroad, so all they did was go back and forth from Boston to Worcester. And we had other trains that went from Worcester uh, farther west to, uh, to New York, usually to Albany. So but they would come back, and again, those white things that you see right in front of the engine, those are the big wooden crossing gates. Now these, now you can see them there, and they're, they're in the upright position. Now right there is where the, the uh, passengers would sit. This was in the early days where they, before they had built an outside platform for them with, a, with covering. So if, the tra if it was raining, you had to sit out there in the rain. The fire track was the train that would be going to Worcester. The close track would be the train that would be coming and going towards Boston. Another beautiful tree. And right behind that tree to the right of it is where 7-Eleven is. So if this gives you an idea, um, that's East Main Street on your left in the picture. So the safety of the residents depended on the signalman for the railroad lowering the crossing gates. Um, didn't always happen. Um, there are numerous documented cases in the old chronotype of horses and wagons getting hit by the trains, um, children getting hit by the trains. Um, the former police chief in Westboro was actually killed by a train in one of the surrounding towns because the gates were not put down. That little building to the right is where the gateman was supposed to hang out. Now remember, these are the days before telephone, they're before radios, so he had his little pocket watch. And that train, if it was supposed to run on time, and it was supposed to be in Westboro at 8.15, he better have those gates down so nobody would get hurt. One of the things that used to happen is because of the trains sometimes always coming through without being noticed or coming a little, little, little early or a little late, they would leave the gates down whenever there was a parade. This was a 4th of July parade where the parade would come up South Street, go up to the railroad gates, make a U-turn, and then go back out West Main Street. So again, that little building is where that guy was supposed to grow, and he had to go, he had to raise all four gates and lower them all by hand. Now, here he is hanging out far, far away from where he should be. <laughs> Caught on camera. Um, way in the distance on the right, you can see the Burnside building. That's the old uh, freight station on the left. And you can see that they had just built a platform uh, or a covering for the uh, benches over on the right-hand side for the, for, the, uh, for the passengers. The building to the left, where you can see the, uh, the billboard on the building, that's where 7-Eleven is right now. So you're, we're looking back towards the rotary. He's probably wondering, what's this crazy photographer doing on the tracks, <laughs> taking pictures? Now, when the train arrived in Westboro, what did, uh, what did the people see when they get off? Well, this, this picture is taken from, uh, we believe, from the, uh, the top of the National Straw Works building. And this was the Adams House. That's, again, right where 7-Eleven is right now. They would see this when they came in. So if they needed a place to stay, you got to understand that the railroad was instrumental in getting salesmen to go to all these different businesses. All these businesses needed supplies. And you know, you didn't have a telephone, you didn't have a catalog, you would you wait for the salesman to show up and you would place your order and he'd make sure everything got delivered to your business. 
A few years later, it became the Westboro Hotel. Again, that's exactly right where 7-Eleven is, and you're looking down South Street. Um, because of the train and being downtown, all of a sudden we started having multiple buildings being built. Um, this is the second generation building on the right. The first one, um, guess what happened to it? <laughs> Burned to the ground. You guys are good. It was actually an arson fire. Antonio Joan was a disgruntled tenant in one of the rooming houses and he burned the building down. However, the building was rebuilt and farther down we had a, a Chinese laundry, we had a fish market, we had all sorts, everything you need in Westboro. The, the business thrived because we had so many people coming into Westboro. Now, if you didn't, if you didn't find the, the room at the, the Westboro Hotel nice you'd, you'd go here to the Whitney house the Whitney house was right at the uh, the site where the Westboro police station is now the old high school next to the cemetery um, this was a upscale hotel and one of the things that they told everybody was it has electricity <laughs> that was a big big deal the, uh, the hotel was one of the first to have electricity in every room and electric lights and we and if you stayed there, you didn't have to worry about anything because in the back, we had a blacksmith shop, we had a livery, and we had, uh, they could take care of your horses, they could um, uh, take care if you had a wagon, you had a problem, they could take care of that out back. We had an apothecary, Lowe's apothecary on the, on the first floor on the right. We had a um, small grocery store in the center of the building. So whatever you needed was all available right here at the, the hotel. Now guess what happened to this building? It burned, it burned down. You're right. <laughs> now, and now, you know, being a firefighter, it's a little embarrassing, I have to tell you. <laughs> However, this building here burned down because even though everything was all electric, had electric lights, they had two kerosene lanterns over the pool tables on the top floor. And for some reason, one of them exploded. And when it did, it lit the top of the building on fire. And there was, the fire was actually too high up for the fire hoses to reach it with the water. So it did burn down. But when it was an operation, and it was only an operation for about 15 years, Mr. Reed, who ran the place, he was a businessman. He was a smart businessman. He would, uh, he, he enlisted a, a, the, the young kids from the neighborhoods, gave them a stack of cars, and said, go down to the train station when the train comes in, and for every, uh, every person that you can bring up here to the hotel, I'll give you uh, a bonus. And the boys would carry the bags up, and they would explain, well, this is a much, much nicer hotel. And you can see, it says this is a first-class hotel in Westboro, unlike the other rooming houses. So, besides the hotels, what else prospered? Well, we had drugstores. Uh, this is C.S. Henry. Everybody remembers, if, you, if you're my age, uh, it was Boyce's Drugstore, or the Westboro Drug Company. Uh, for years and years and years. Um, the Boyce family purchased it from C.S. Henry. And if you'll notice also in the building, it's hard to see, but can you see on the corner, I mean, I hate using this, but I want to show you where it is. Right there. You see the mortar and pestle? Right on the corner of the building. This is where Ferris Flowers is right now. Um, and then over to the right, see the great big tooth? These are all gold plated or gold leaf. And the reason they did that is we had a certain percentage of the population that was illiterate. So if you had a toothache and you couldn't read, you knew that if you saw that big gold tooth, that there was a dentist there, and Dr. Judd, the dentist, was upstairs. So he could take care of it. If you needed some, some medicine, you saw that mortar and pestle, you knew that's where the, the, the apothecary was. So, and these are, uh, I think, some of the neatest, neatest pictures of the town with some of these old signs. Um, you've probably seen the ones with the, uh, the uh, eyeglasses that hang outside the eyeglass shop. Kind of neat. 
Now here we have an inside view. These are very, very rare inside views um, because the cameras required a lot of light and it, they would take a long time for an exposure. So it's unusual, but this is Buxton's Rexall store. Um, they were on West Main Street. As you were going out West Main Street, they were on the right, right near the center. And they had uh, you know, your little ice cream stand there, ice cream. They sold cigars, they sold postcards, they sold you know, almost everything that the drugstore sells today. Except, you know, like CVS, the lawn furniture and the, <laughs> the vacuum cleaners. But we had three of those in town. We had, and so that tells you how busy the downtown was. Now, Westboro really did become a transportation hub, the center of Westboro. And the reason for that is the way the town was laid out. We had three different trolley companies, and all the trolleys merged in the center of Westboro. One trolley would take you to North Grafton, Grafton, Milbury. Another trolley would take you to Hopkins or Milford. Another trolley would take you down East Main Street into Northboro or Marlboro. So if you were a traveling salesman and you had to go to these surrounding towns, you knew that you could leave the hotel, walk downtown, go to Buxton's waiting room, and they also had a, uh, um, you could get your tickets on the trolley, um, and you could, you could get candy, you could have a great time. And you can wait for the trolley, and then off you'd go. So there's, uh, from what the town looked like in a very short period of time, you know, 40, 50 years, relatively speaking, the town changed so dramatically. Um, now, what's interesting in this picture, the building on the right, the post office block, that's where the post office moved to. Um, that was built in seven, uh, 1876. Uh, that's been torn down and was replaced by the new apartments. Um, and the building to your left, that's still there. That's where the West Road Package Store is, or used to be, and now it's, I think it's now a beer and wine shop. Um, so, and if you look on the top of that building, way on the roof, you see something that looks like a triangle on the left. And you see that, that underneath that, there's three windows. Instead of just having one window every every few feet. That was a photo studio. The reason we have so many of these great images of Westboro and these great pictures is because Westboro had half a dozen commercial photographers mm -hmm. in town. So they would take photographs of the parades. If there was a disaster, every fire, they would take pictures of the, the burned out buildings. Um, there's some great, great pictures of Westboro that you know, other, I talk to people in other towns and say, where do all these great pictures of Westboro come from? Because they don't have them in some of these other towns. And that's, that's because we were lucky enough to have all the photographers. So again, with hundreds of passengers every day, the local business, the local shops prospered. We had, you know, as you can see, the Glenwood Range, we had a stove, show, stove shop, the, uh, the wagon, um, belongs to the Woodman Hardware Company. That's that little small building right here. And they were, we had a bunch of hardware stores in Westboro, but they were different. They had one that would more, that would have like more like piping, like Woodman's would have piping, screws, hardware, um, paints, things like that. The other hardware store across the street would have plow, impl plow implements, um, a lot of things for the farmers to use. So each one had their own specialty. They weren't competing with each other. They were complementing each other. And then way down, way just past the, uh, the, uh, the post office block, you can see a little tiny building there. That was a grocery store. And there was also a, uh, a fish market to the right of that. That originally was one of the schools in Westboro. And they closed it and it became, a, uh, became available for, for merchants to set up. Now, it wasn't just manufacturing. We did have some agricultural use. And this is what I find fascinating. Um, Westboro was one of the biggest transporters of milk to Boston in the area. And we had our own milk co-op at Westboro. And believe it or not, I actually 
found a certificate from the 1860s of this particular co-op at, uh, at a show. And hard to believe, but the name of the farmer that had brought his milk off there to drop it off, his name was Kittredge. <laughs> hard to believe. No, no relation, but I, I think he, I tell everybody he was. Um, so if you're a farmer, you could be allowed to bring down 30 bottles, 30 uh, cans of milk, you'll see, I'll explain that. They, they came down here, this was down again in the, uh, the freight, where all the freight sightings were. They had especially, this is a, uh, this is, this photo's from a museum, where they have actually one of the restored milk cars from the Wasson of Maine. These cars are especially equipped to hold metal milk cans. And you've all seen them, especially in New England. Everybody, everybody's got an old farmhouse, has one sitting outside, you know, with flowers in it. Um, you were able to, if you were a farmer, you could bring up to 30 quarts, or 30 can containers to the, uh, to the co-op. An agent would take your milk cans, put them on the train, mark them, and then he would ride with the train all the way to Boston. Sometimes there were 20 cars filled with milk that would go to Boston. Once they arrived in Boston, he would supervise the unloading, make sure if you had 30 cans of milk, you would get the money that you agreed on in advance. Then they would wash the cans, they would sterilize them, and then they'd bring them back to Westboro and they'd put them in a special room. So the next day you could go down and pick them all up and bring them back to your farm and start it all over again. Now we talked about shipping everything uh, by rail, and everything had to be in wood, but what if you wanted to ship something to somebody in a different part of the country? Um, and it was big, you can't bring it to the post office. So you'd bring it to the Adams Express Agency. They were on the left hand side of this building. And you would tell them, all right, I want this bicycle shipped to my brother in Ohio. They would handle all the paperwork, they would get it crated, they would get it on the train, and when it got to its destination at the station in Ohio, one of their agents again would pick it up and deliver it to your cousin in Ohio. So they were very important. Um, and they actually, his company, he actually left after Adams Express, and he actually ended up starting, um, worked with Railway Express Agency. And a lot of the photographs that I have of Westboro that I recently acquired were taken by an employee of the Railway Express Agency that was in Westboro for two years while they were um, changing the business over. So in 1899, the railroad tracks were relocated. And they put them down to their present location. You can see the original bridge, and the engineers all sat down, they said, well, we gotta make this really strong, because you know, in 2020, <laughs> these 55 foot trailer trucks that weigh that are 13 and a half feet tall are going to smash onto this bridge every week. So we need to make it strong. Well, they did. That bridge hasn't moved an inch. Um, so people say, well, let's do something. Let's fix it. It's a big inconvenience. And it really is. They can't lower the road anymore. The town's lowered it as much as it can because there's water lines and sewer lines underneath and telephones and electric lines. They can't raise the bridge because the railroad said for every foot that you raise the bridge requires three and a half miles of redoing the railroad track in both directions because of the grade. This is an uphill grade coming from Cedar Swamp uh, through Westboro. And they're certainly not about to stop railroad traffic on the, on the busiest commuter lines and railroad transportation lines in the area for that. So it's something that we're all gonna have to get used to and good luck. <laughs> the house on the left, that's the house that's just being restored right now, the corner of High Street. Um, it looks a little different there. It's, um, people have asked, well, why do they park the cars on the, on the lawn? Well, the carriage house that went to that house was sold off separately some years ago, and that, the carriage house has the driveway. So it's a separate piece of property. So the parking lot that we now see that comes in off of High Street is what they have to use to park the cars. They're going to uh, re re uh, repurpose the building into a three-family in apartments, and it hopes to be available uh, sometime this fall. 
So we have a beautiful new train station. If you are familiar with the type of structures that the Boston and Albany Railroad use, this is the type of style that they use. Even though, even though this isn't an exact um, station done by the Boston and Albany architects, it's similar. It, uh, it's a beautiful building. Um, on the far side of the building is where the, patient, the passengers would go in and, and sit down and, and, and get maybe a, a newspaper. They had some candy there. Everybody loved candy back then. And on this side is the freight area. And you can see the little freight man. He's just waiting for the, sitting there with his little wagon to, uh, to unload that freight when it comes in. Um, so from 1899 to 1960, um, that's when the train stopped. And they picked up and delivered passengers to the station um, I happened to be there in 1975 when there was a special train brought uh, uh, Governor Dukakis to Westboro for a Chamber of Commerce meeting. He was coming out on a Boston, Maine mud liner. The train broke down. They hooked an engine to it, and then the engine delivered the mud liner to the Westboro station. Um, that was the start of, I really think the, you know, the start of expanding commuter rail out this way. Uh, people were very unhappy when it, when it stopped, but. Um, we now had buses that could get their people quicker, and a lot of people had cars. You know, times changed. And again, not everything went perfect. This is down near Cedar Swamp, um, down near the far end of the Bay State Island. The passenger train had just left the Westboro station heading towards Boston, and there was a freight train that was um, moving cars around, shuttling cars and setting up a train of freight cars to move out and the two steam engines collided. And the engineer failed to send his brakeman out with a red lantern to warn the trains that they were going to be occupying the tracks. So um, it was a mess. We had, luckily none of the passenger cars were involved because they weren't going fast enough but a lot of the freight cars were destroyed and the two steam engines were destroyed. And luckily, they didn't, they did, the steam boilers didn't blow up, so we didn't get anybody killed, but one of the engineers and one of the conductors were injured. And Westboro sent two of the finest physicians down there to, uh, to help out. And uh, as typical of what a community did back then, everybody came down to help. And unfortunately, a lot of people came down to watch. <laughs> now this was a big, big deal. So, now, ironically, this is, this is a little newer, but in 1964, the same thing happened in the same area. We had another big train derailment, and, and we're hearing all of these things about train derailments on the news over the last month. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not as uncommon as you might think. So, this is on the road down to the Bay State Island towards Cedar Swamp, all, like I say, almost the same area. Um, there was a 65 car train. There were two of them that were filled with wheat going to Russia. And the first train went through okay without any problems. The second train derailed and 22 freight cars were destroyed and uh, broke out uh, and, and emptied their loads along the tracks. Now these, these two boys here, I went to school with the one on the right, that's Johnny Farquhar and his older brother, they somehow got very close to the train guys. And the FBI determined it was just a broken wheel, it wasn't sabotaged, even though the longshoremen in Boston had refused to load the ships with the wheat that was coming in. They said it was un-American, so they refused to load the, the wheat. So, and for many years, we grew along the tracks. Um, one, of the, one of the things that happened was a lot of people went down with little glass jars. They would pick up some of the wheat. Uh, a lady from town told me she still has the one. Her mother went down, picked it up, put it in wheat from train wreck. She still has it. And it took a while um, to get everything all squared away, but everything, like everything else, they cleaned it up and go away and you'd, you'd never know they were there. 
So in the 1920s, um, Bay State Abrasives started to really boom as a manufacturing company. Um, salesmen arrived by train, they would walk to the factory to promote their industrial products. Now remember, we're now talking, you know, from the 20s and into the 50s, we're talking about a, a company that employed uh, over a couple thousand people, three shifts, and they were the primary supplier to U.S. steel and to the automotive industries. Um, their steel snagging wheels were the mainstay of uh, on the automotive industry. So everything that you could imagine that they would need in a factory back in the 20s and the 30s had to come from a salesman. So these salesmen would get off from the train station, walk over, walk over with their catalogs and pamphlets, take all the orders, and make sure that they got shipped back to uh, Bay State in the following weeks. Now, if you notice the straight tracks that go right to the bottom all the way into the horizon, those are the original tracks that came through the center of Westboro. Way up there on the left, you can see um, where it, it, it takes a turn to the left. Uh, the building in the front is one of the Bay State Abrasives buildings. All these sidings in the back were for Bay State Abrasives. That's where they uh, would store some of the raw materials that were coming in, and behind, uh, behind it, they, they had also cars that were all loaded with finished goods that were waiting to be taken to, to uh, out west. On the right-hand side, those are the old J.S. Nason coal sheds. That's where the trains would come in, and still a lot of people, you know, heated by coal. And we actually had oil tanks at that time. And you see the flat cars on the bottom right. It looked like telephone poles on them. On them, they're most likely telephone poles have been treated up at the Montan uh, Treating Company, which is located off of Smith Valley Parkway um, and uh, Otis Street. That's where the super fun site is because of the the creosote. They built these great big lagoons and they put the telephone poles in, covered them with creosote, pulled them out, put them on flat cars, and then shipped them uh, throughout New England. It's not shown in this picture, but farther down towards this way, all, all, the, all the tracks that you see there, now on the bottom, they all became sidings, and there were different manufacturers used them. The one on the far right was actually used to deliver automobiles to Westboro. The automobiles back then would come in covered box cars, not in the big train cars that they, that they use now. There would be two, sometimes four cars in a box car. They would come in, and they'd drive them right out the door, and they would park them. And there's a picture of about 25 brand new cars that had just been delivered. And from there, remember, these came all the way from Detroit. They would come here to Westboro, and then they would, they would get delivered to the local dealerships in New England. So the New York Central Railroad was the railroad that moved all the freight from Boston to Albany. And, you know, we talked about the noise and the stink and the smell. Well, there's a perfect example for it. That's a train that's under heavy load going up the, remember this is going uphill now, it doesn't look like it, but it's going up the hill. And it's, um, you know, a lot of noise, a lot of smell, a lot of stink, going by the old station. Now, the railroad had many names, originally from the Boston to Worcester, became then the Boston and Albany, expanded. Then it became the New York Central. And then the New York Central merged with the Pennsylvania Railroad and became the Penn Central. Then they took all these railroads and they consolidated them and they called, they, call, they called it Consolidated Rail, or Conrail. And then finally CSX uh, purchased the rights from when they dismantled Conrail, or Consolidated Rail. And they have it for freight in this part of the country. And the MBTA along with Amtrak has passenger service. So this is the one of the I think one of the best pictures of it. It shows all the passenger cars with 11 cars full of people, you know, heading towards uh, New York on the uh, on the train, just going through quiet little Westboro. Well, I hope you've uh, enjoyed a little little history. Anybody have any questions at all on this? If I don't know the answer, I'll make one up.